the, the first question is about this connectical school that is okay. that Olu was mentioning to me. I mean, he he says I'm naming it the connectical school. Of course, there is not a school, a real school, as a building. Yes, and, yeah. Yeah. So if you could please tell me why you, he consider you and Colin and Lani to be the three artists from the connectical school. Well, first of all. Uh, uh, Colin and Lonnie and myself, we, we all went to the University of Connecticut. We were all in the master's program. And then Colin and I did some collaborations that had to do with um, community engagement. And uh, we chose this um, vehicle of a boat through which we engaged communities and built a boat and sailed it and, and told stories about a town where Colin both and I lived. Um, and uh, so I think for Olu, it's like a conceptual frame. Okay. I grew up in Moscow in Russia and I lived in Philadelphia um, a big part of my life. So when I came to the University of Connecticut, I, you know, I really enjoyed the sort of engagement with the land uh, that is around here. Um, and I feel that maybe uh, when I was living in those large cities, I was always drawn to the countryside somehow. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't say that I'm averse working in cities, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but I am very interested, especially lately, in the slow movement mm -hmm. and uh, the slow food movement and this um, also meditation and a kind of an ability to be present in the world without being torn, uh, torn in many different uh, um, directions by technology and things of that nature. How can you do that? It's difficult. Yeah. I would like to do the same, but sometimes I feel the pressure of our times that are constantly changing so quickly in terms of geopolitical uh, assessments and, you know, migrations and environments and technologies. So how can we slow down? I agree. I think that we're, well, well one thing I think is that we are a very smart animal. Hmm. And, I don't know. <laughs> and, and probably, you know, we, um, for instance, human beings have uh, been able to use the Earth's resources more, more than any other animal on this planet. You know, we, we are able to to find out what is important to us and to mine those things and to gather those things. We, we grow rapidly, we expand rapidly, we use re resources rapidly, and uh, that allows us to expand. But we're not smart enough, I don't think, to understand our own impact, not only on the planet itself, but on ourselves as well. So I think you know they're they're actually um, they're actually um, a certain amount of information that we can uh, process without um, without sort of melting down, right? And normally that's uh, maybe as much information as two people talking to you at the same time. That's enough to process. Mm -hmm. But if you get three people talking to you at the same time, you already start to lose uh, your focus. And so with all these technologies we've invented, we are, we are now overloaded by, by this inflation. And for me personally, it just, I can feel it physically. You know, I can feel it in my body when I'm overloaded or when I'm, when I'm at peace, right? So, so, so it's very attractive for me to, to sort of fight the, the, um, the culture of overload. You know that I feel energetically. Okay, and then uh, would you like yeah to share with us something about your work, your approach to to art, and maybe the the, the projects you're you know you're working on at the moment? 
Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, there are two programs I'm interested in talking about, and um, um, <clears throat> one is called the Healing Blues Project. Um, another one is called the, the Mother Tongue um, Project. Uh, so, so I, I guess up until about uh, 2004, I was a painter. And I did landscapes and cityscapes and things of that nature, uh, and some of them were sort of semi, uh, semi um, uh, abstract. Uh, and then I came to the University of Connecticut, a uh, master's program, and I became interested in sort of experimenting, you know. And at the same time, to support myself as a painter, I was a carpenter, so I built things. And I, and I started to build environments, and, and I started to use video in those environments, and I started to have people interact with those environments. So, so to me, uh, and the, the work really was about, it, it was really about tribalism um, and territorialism. So also as this smart animal, we have not evolved past our tribal and territorial impulses, right? So that became very interesting to me, and, and I kind of discovered that, hey, this is uh, much more interesting for me to work in this way and to work experimentally and to engage people on their terms. And uh, so at that point, I made a decision that media was not going to influence how I work, so I wasn't going to select I work in video or I work in performance or whatever. So I'm so I'm so so I feel the freedom to work in any way possible, right? So I can write a, a an instruction for someone uh, to perform something, or I can make a video, or I can make an installation, and that frees me. I think like um, uh, what what is bouncing around in my head comes out in different ways, which is very freeing to me. And um, so the the latest works are social practice works and. I really love engaging with people. The most interesting things to do for me is to engage with um, communities that are somehow marginalized. So, um, so communities that are um, oppressed in some way or marginalized in some way. Um, and so the Healing Blues Project, uh, I was living in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, which is in the Piedmont region of uh, the U.S. And uh, there's a kind of a blues there. It's called the Piedmont uh, Blues. And it's a little bit different uh, from uh, the Mississippi Delta Blues. The Mississippi Delta is a little more uh, isolated, and the Piedmont has other influences. So um, different, other different American music is influenced that area. That area. So they have a a uh, very old, um, uh, they have a very old festival, blues festival there. And to promote this festival, they asked artists to create work, uh, to create work that would um, uh, talk about the blues. And uh, at the time, I was already engaged with uh, uh, an organization that helps the homeless. It's called the Interactive Resource Center in Greensboro, North Carolina. And uh, they're a day center. And they're remarkable because they have all kinds of interesting programs. For instance, they have a, a writing workshop for homeless folks. They have a newspaper that homeless uh, people put out for others who are living on the streets. They have an artist collaborative where, where artists, uh, homeless artists make work and then uh, some of the funds they, they make on their art comes, comes back to the collaborative to buy materials and supplies and things of that nature. So it's a very innovative center. And so my idea was, well, who in Greensboro, North Carolina is actually experiencing the blues right now? Mm -hmm. And this was this homeless community. And uh, so the idea became, let's get a blues musician to get together with a homeless person. Together they write a song and they both get copyright on a song as co-creators. And then we create an album, and then we uh, sell that album to to fund uh, the interactive resource center, or to or to help fund the interactive resource center. There's a mu very interesting museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. It's called Elsewhere Museum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's really a social practice space. And uh, so we had sort of a series of cafes where we invite homeless folks and blues musicians to get together, learn about each other, and write songs together. 
And so then uh, I asked a colleague of mine who at the time we were both at Greensboro College uh, in North Carolina, and he was uh, he was uh, he's a musician, Dave Fox. So he produced the songs and produced an album. And the album is called The Healing Blues. Um, it, it's a CD. It's called The Healing Blues CD. So, um, and one uh, individual uh, who's a homeless storyteller on the album, we, we had a series of meetings and, and me at IRC. My, and my original idea, nobody was going to get paid. The blues musicians don't get paid. The homeless people don't get paid. Well, this guy, Shannon Stewart, he said, well, you know, I'd like to get paid. I'd like like $25 for my story, you know. And then the director of the IRC at the time, she said, well, we'd like you to have most of the money from this project uh, to go to the homeless folks. So then we made a decision to, to give half of the money to the organization and half of the money to the storytellers. Mm -hmm. So they received about three hundred dollars um, um, honorarium for their story and copyright on the album. And now the album has been uh, produced and has been uh, being sold for the past, I would say, year and a half, maybe. And it's been uh, it's been pretty interesting. So the second project I'm very engaged with right now is it's called Mother Tongue. What is your mother tongue? So it's Russian. Yeah. Ah, so you're bilingual. Yeah. So I grew up. I grew up. Um, actually, my grandmother was an American who went to Russia in the '30s um, and stayed for 50 years and uh, married there. And uh, so I was br I was brought up, and I learned Russian and English simultaneously. I would say. Yeah. Um, and then so we lived in the Soviet Union and. Uh, uh, Although we traveled a lot within the Soviet Union, like we went to the Crimea and we went to uh, Georgia or uh, Estonia, uh, we really could not leave the parameters of the Soviet Union. You know? um, and uh, since you know the wall has fallen, and uh, um, I, I live in America now, I became very interested in uh, uh, exploring Eastern Europe. So, so I've traveled a lot in Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, all these other places. And, uh, and um, the language is also interesting to me. It's slightly different everywhere I go, you know. Um, and so I had an artist residency in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. And it was in a town called Oryakhova. And Oryakhova sits on a hill and it overlooks the Danube River. And it looks to Romania, so you see Romania. Um, and at one point, when I was in this residency, I thought a lot of the work I've done has been about borders and this sort of territorial nature that we have. And so I thought well, it, w it would be interesting to cross this border, you know. And since the Danube is a, you know, it's a flexible border, you know, I thought, well, I could swim across the Danube. And so I did this piece. It was called uh, "Crossing the Danube," and I crossed, I swam across the Danube from um, Romania to Bulgaria, and it had some, uh, it had some interest to uh, Bulgarians because that's actually the direction uh, that tribe originally came from. Mm -hmm. They came from the south and crossed the Danube into Bulgaria, where they settled, um, and so. Um, and then, it, so so that piece was called "Crossing the Danube," and, and I kind of started to understand the Danube to be this this divide, this cultural divide and geographic divide, and a natural border. And uh, so, at another time, I was teaching in Germany, and I was afterwards going to travel back to that residency in Oryakhova, and I thought, well, actually, how can I travel? And I thought, oh, the Danube starts in Germany. Mm -hmm. And then I can go to Oryakhova. And uh, then I sort of came up with this idea for this project, Mother Tongue. So, so, so I've traveled down the river on all different forms of marine transportation, from the Black Forest in Germany to the Delta, Ukraine and Romania. And in each country, I, I interview people. I have an audio recorder. And, and I ask them to talk to me about the river, 
and then their neighbors on the river. So for instance, if I'm in Hungary, I ask people how they feel about the uh, Austrians and the Serbs and the Slovaks, for instance. And then I ask them um, how they feel about borders in general mm. and then about the possibility of no borders. Yeah, and, it's such an issue nowadays. Yeah, it's actually really interesting because when I started the project, it was about uh, three or four years ago and I traveled down and everyone was saying, well, we're in Schengen space. There's no, there are no borders anymore. We can travel at any point. But then with the, with the recent uh, war in Syria and other things, uh, many of these countries are securing their borders now. So yeah, It's quite a sad situation now. Everywhere in the world, but in, in Europe is even worse. The feeling we all have is quite sad. Yeah, well, I think that there are really two positions, two major positions. And one is, you know, why should we close our borders? These are people and they're, you know, experiencing difficulty and we should support them. And the other position is uh, these people could hurt us and we need to protect ourselves. Of course, yeah. Right? So, um, so that's a lot of, so the, the, the way this project looks, it's a video, and it, it describes the Danube for about an hour from the beginning to the end, let's say five to six or seven minutes in each country. It just shows the river and its surrounds. And then overlaid is the audio of people talking about these issues. And when I started the project, people primarily talked about this Schengen space and the openness, but now uh, this year I was in Hungary for a month finishing the editing of the video and you hear a lot of things about um, uh, right-wing parties wanting to close down the borders. So um, that's the second project. Uh, so, but if you feel like adding anything else to our conversation, please feel free. Well, I mean, it's a, a, I could reiterate that I think that um, so these very you know, these very smart creatures that we are, we're, we're able to mine the world for humans uh, for what we desire, but we are not quite um, intelligent enough to understand the, the, the scope of the damage that we do. And I think our own sort of tribal and uh, territorial nature prevents us from evolving together as a group, you know, a and to also be uh, cognizant and mindful of other groups of uh, living things that, that we are on board with. So really what I think about is how humanity uh, needs to evolve beyond their sort of, um, uh, beyond their impulse and um, to, to protect uh, only their own groups, you know, because, because in this way we're actually destroying the planet we, we're living on. I'm interested in doing another project in Rome. I want to give cameras to people who are refugees living in Rome, and I, and I want them to create uh, like um, uh, a guide. I want to create a, a guide from refugees for refugees on how to navigate uh, the city of Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because actually Rome, I think, was founded by a, a refugee. <laughs> <laughs> sorts and there are so many architectural uh, references to war and slavery and uh, and and uh, displacement you know like the Tower of Trajan for instance uh, let me know if you're coming so that I can come to visit you yeah that would be wonderful yeah yes. so uh, Ted thank you for for this conversation it was very interesting Thank you.